beautiful modern summer afternoon in the woods of New England. And this historic spot. Tragic clash of tr cultures, a tragedy of history. The native peoples who had been accustomed to the use of this land for thousands of years and suddenly <clears throat> a European cu a culture arrives with a whole different mindset about the use of properties, the use of resources and it couldn't help but happen, the clash of cultures and the dominant, eventual dominance of one culture over another and the eventual remnant of the early culture still existing among us, still, still, still among us. I recommend several books to help, have helped me understand what's, what's happened. <coughs> Changes in the Land by Cronin, C-R-O-N-A-N, I believe, C-R-O-N-A-N. Slap me if I'm wrong, but Changes in the Land by Cronin and the History of New England Before the Mayflower or something like that by Russell. New England Before the Mayflower by Russell. And those books help you understand those clashes of culture. A war captain was cornered here. This is a typical location, possibly for somebody on the run, who knew, very well knew the final outcome. One, one thinks of a Christ carrying a cross, and one thinks of a, a native guy being pursued. He knew the outcome, that he wasn't gonna, he wasn't gonna come out of this, no, no, no how, if, the, if he was caught up with. And in the end, <clears throat> It happened. He was he was betrayed. He, yeah, he was promised things. The promises were broken. The Puritan culture of Boston was a, a very vindictive, uh, a very vindictive mindset, and the, the old war captain was betrayed. Here, this was the last major. Uh, historic part of the King Philip War. And then it began, the, the transition of the land to what we know today. Typical of a place to come and hide or get away from pursuit. A promontory, a place where one could see what was going on around. But the old war captain let his guard down. He allowed himself to be snuck up, snuck up upon. And his party was set upon here. This is what I would call a rock shelter. And the United States right across from shore to shore is uh, rock shelters all across the United States in different forms. Go to Utah, go to the Rockies, go to wherever. Native peoples would kitty up against things like this for a shelter against the wind, a place to light a fire, a place to get out of the weather, a place to escape pursuit, hot pursuit. And this is what the old war captain was doing here, trying to escape hot pursuit. We're in the Palmer River watershed, one of a number of small watersheds between the Blackstone River watershed, the Taunton River watershed. These small watersheds in between are all draining, all running to Narragansett Bay. Where we sit now, we are bay oriented. We are only a few hours from being down to the bay. 
to being to very common living areas for the Wampanoags of Poconoket and, and earlier on, th a few thousand years prior, peoples that we call archaic peoples, whom we don't know what they call themselves. We, we, we haven't a clue. There's no, there's no history. But they, they evolved from paleo to the archaic cultures, to the woodland cultures, to the contact period cultures, to the betrayal of Anawan and his, and his family group. Palmer River runs to Narragansett Bay, two major branches. One branch, called the East Branch, crosses Route 44 just below us, runs down along parallel to 44 and Route 118, comes back under Route 118 near County Street, near the bog, a place that you're going to in a, in a little while, in through Rehoboth Village, <coughs> out of Rehoboth Village, under 44, further down, through the grounds of the Palmer River School, and right adjacent to the Palmer River School, the, the west branch of the Palmer River joins a confluence. If you go to the Palmer River School today, get out and walk, I suggest that. You, you'll see the confluence of the Palmer River. West branch of the Palmer River comes from near the Red Fox Club, near the Chartley Country Store. Crosses Fairview Avenue, uh, winds down around, takes the waters of Bliss Brook, which drains from near the south face of Oak Hill in Attleboro. Those waters come around, down through Perryville. Wolf Plain Brook joins those waters. Wolf Plain Brook drains from Pine Street near the radio towers in Rehoboth. Those waters join and then those waters f combine and flow down through South Rehoboth, down into a little part of Swansea today and into the tidal estuary that is associated with Warren, Rhode Island, Mount Hope, Montop, Mount Hope, the home, the ancestral home of the Poconoke at the Wampanoag. That's it. In, in all these little watersheds drained to the bay and the native peoples that took, took the resources, advantaged themselves of the resources of nearby Narragansett Bay, used these little watershed areas for hunting and gathering. And what we fail to realize in our modern context is the dynamic environment that existed in these swamplands. The beaver colonies, the beaver colonies that existed here really transformed this landscape and made it so diverse for the native peoples. And within the, the passage of the 1600s, the beaver locally were gone, gone. We've got them now, they're coming back there. We have some in Cumberland, Rhode Island. We have some in Natick and, and they're coming back, but they're gonna create problems with our modern drainage systems and culvert systems. And I, I'm going off. I participated for four to five summers on days like this just south of Rehoboth Village in a dig, an archeological dig, when I was younger and, and more physically able. I worked with a group associated with the Massachusetts Archeological Society. And we excavated what is known now as the Toby site. You have it on your video. If you go to the Carpenter Museum in Rehoboth, I think they may have a display there with a, a stone tool collection that we, we excavated from the Toby site. 
Uh, there is a display, a table display, a small display, presently at the Robbins Museum of Archaeology in Middleborough, Massachusetts. You can go there and see that. It's only a small display. I wish they had some of the stone tools in that display. But we went back to the archaic period that predated the woodland era. And we found what we think had been a sweat pit, which was common among the native culture. And I had the unique, unique uh, ability to be there that day when our dig director hit, hit the, uh, the fire feature deep in the ground, deeper than native people usually dug in the ground. And what they did, they, for whatever reason, they made sweat pit or a sweat lodge. They dug in the ground. We found the ramp, the stain in the soil, different colors in the soil. We found the ramp where they would crawl in and out, probably covered the open pit with branches, animal hides, lit a fire down in there, a substantial fire, heated rocks, just like they do in Europe, dumped water from a nearby lake, wetland, on those rocks, made steam, kiddied in there and cleansed themselves. For whatever reason, whether it was a bodily cleansing uh, was uh, a combination of body cleansing and spiritual, some kind of spiritual uh, function. We don't know. There's no, there's no, uh, no way of knowing. But that's what we found over there in, in Rehoboth Village. Amongst other things, we found assemblages of stone tools, uh, part of an addle addle weight that would have been used for throwing darts and spears, broken wing of one of those. We found an assemblage of sandstone hand scrapers for working hides, scraping hides. That told us there were women on the, in there because that was a, a, a division of labor. That was usually a, a woman's or a child's part of the labor of people. We found thousands and thousands of pieces, fragments of burned waterfowl bone still in the soil. It's still, it's still there today. I could take you there today and we could put a, a test pit down and I guarantee you we're going to find calcite bone in the soil. And the other thing we found during our excavation were little, little, tiny little fragments. You'd say, how can you find this? How can you see this? You can. Carbonized fragments of nut hulls from a fire. And in, in the remnants of the fire pits that we found, carbon samples for flotation analysis so that somebody who was expert in the field could float the organic stuff in that carbon residue and get a better fix on the type of organic resources that were being utilized in that site approximately 4,300 years before the present. 4,300 years. Put that back in your minds in context in history. With some of the earliest known human history here in New England, you're going back 10,000 years. And some of that, a lot of that history, we think, is off the coast under the sea because of the rising sea levels. Paleo. And paleo land sites are very, very rare here in New England. And then when we get into the archaic period and we get into the early archaic period, those sites are very rare. 
that what we found here in Rehoboth, stone-wise, were uh, rare chirts that they made tools from. We found the common white quartz, gray and green argillite, Attleboro red felsite, quartzite, uh, granite hammer stones. That's the stuff I remember. Spare points of the Stark and Neville, uh, Stark and Neville time frame, which they carbon date back into the archaic period. Brewerton, Brewerton spare points, stem spare points. Nancy was there one Sunday afternoon. I was working a square, and we came up with the most beautiful rose quartz stem spear point. It looked like the person who, who, who made it had just, just got done making it. She was blown away. And here was this rose quartz spear point I to make a sitting in the ground, 4,300 years old. This is, and this stuff, this stuff still exists here in the Palmer River drainage in the other drainages. Unfortunately, our modern culture has obliterated a lot of it, but it's not all gone. It, it's, still, it's still here. Just like the actual living remnants of the, of the human culture who are still here, the Wamp Wampanoag, the Gay Head, the Mashpee, uh, the Narragansett, uh, you, you ladies can name some others, our, our dig Director was uh, over here in Rehoboth was part Cherokee. Oh, the thing I wanted to say about the, get me on the pronunciation, the Squanaconk Swamp. Bring me up in modern terms. Is there a trailhead for the Rehoboth Land Trust? Uh, Mr. Dyer, the civil engineer, donated about 400 acres of the Squanaconk uh, Swamp to the Rehoboth Land Trust. If you look at a map to orient, a, a modern map of Rehoboth today, and follow the eastern bound of Rehoboth, it's, it's, it's ironic. Up on the northern end, along tr uh, the other side of Tremont Street, you've got a great cedar swamp. That drains to a hem through a hemlock swamp, through a goose brook, that drains eastward into the Wading River, Three Mile River water system into Taunton to form the northern bound of Dighton in Taunton. Now south of that, the Palmer River, there's a little cedar swamp just south of Route 118 behind the corn crib that joins drainage the eastern branch of the Palmer draining Great Maple Swamp between the Corn Crib and the Chartley Country Store. All of that water drains southward to Narragansett Bay. Uh, there's a system of swamps, the, the Little Cedar Swamp, Great Maple Swamp, Squanaconk Swamp, Bad Luck Swamp, Bad Luck Reservoir, which is also termed the Warren Reservoir, and is one that I get tongue-tied on, Manawag, Manawag, Ugh, Manigu Swamp, which is associated in this line of swamps, south of Martin Street, east of Route 118, north of Spring Street before you get to the water tank down Route 118. And that all drains through Rocky Run Brook over to South Rehoboth into the Palmer River below the confluence down Route 44 here. Again, all to 40 to uh, Narragansett Bay. We know that this class of culture has gone on right across 
the United States in one form or another. We know the plight of the Seminole in Florida heading into the, the great swamps of Florida and Georgia, the Cherokee, uh, the Narragansett, the great swamp fight, the Pequot being set upon down there at uh, up above, uh, help me out here. Uh, uh, Mystic. Yeah, yeah, down, down there. And it's it's a common story, a common story. Uh, the Canadian cultures, native cultures in Canada. What can I say? Uh, amongst the native peoples, the way I see it. They had clannish conflicts, clannish misunderstandings. And however they settled those misunderstandings, they had a cultural way of dealing with it. Here, from the Puritans on, it was a possessive, I own it, me, me, me type of thing. And uh, that's where the cultures clash. For instance, the Europeans came here with Pigs. That was common, raised pigs. They came across the Atlantic Ocean. And one of the easiest places to put pigs was on islands, Narragansett Bay. When they got access to the islands down on Narragansett Bay, they turned their pigs loose because they couldn't get away. They were surrounded by ocean. But what did the pigs do? They got into the clam flats and the shellfish flats and decimated the shellfish flats, ate it all up, rooted it all up. That's what pigs do. And they were eating the very food that, that supplied the, the remnant of the native peoples on, on Narragansett Bay. Can I tell you a ghost story quickly? Whether you believe it or you don't. Uh, we used to stop and eat lunch at the Toby site. Midday, Saturdays and Sundays. We'd all pack lunches in. And we had a log and an old stone wall that we'd sit on in the shade. We had some trees and shrubs. And our dig director was a dig director down in Middleborough Lakeville at two archaeological sites, the Yasawamset excavation and the Wapanucket excavation. And at Wapanucket, he used to go in early on Saturday mornings. He lived in Rainham, Brady Fitz. And they would disguise the site during the week so that looters and vandals wouldn't disrupt pertinent parts of the site, dig site. They excavated, but they had to go away and leave it and come back week after week after week. And the site was extremely controversial by today's standards. The things they found, they were secondary human cremation burials, red oak or anointing of those burials. And it's a very, very touchy subject with the native cultures today. I won't get into that debate. I, I'll, I'll, I'll avoid the debate. But one Saturday morning, Brady was in Wapanucket. They had a square that they were gonna excavate that day and he was cleaning it out preparing the square. It had rained, a heavy rain. The soils were soft around him. And it wasn't uncommon for local people to walk by to watch the ex excavation in progress. And he got a feeling, he was alone, and he got a feeling like he was being watched. And I've gotten that feeling in the woods. And he looked up. And across the clearing was a man. And he had a shawl and a broad brim hat, <clears throat> dark hair, 
He may have had braids <coughs> and Brady worked along and he kept looking up and the man would, was still there. So a little while went by and one of the times that he looked up, according to him, this is the story, I'm, this is the lunchtime story down here. The man was gone. So he did what he was doing there before the people came in. And he got curious and he went up and he went over and he walked over. No footprints. Not a footprint in the soil. Now, don't call me cuckoo. I'm just telling you what, what I heard. So he got out amongst the uh, local people one day down in Lakeville. I think he was in a coffee shop. And he got into conversation with a local guy and they got talking about the dig over here in Rehoboth, uh, over at Wapanucket. And Brady re account, relayed the account of his encounter at Wapanucket with the strange guy in the shawl and the broad brim hat. And the guy says, well, describe, describe him to me. And what did he do? And uh, he described the guy. And the guy said, oh, you're one of those people that's seen so-and-so. He's been being seen locally since the end of the King Philip War. And he had a first name. His name was so-and-so. The guy said, you saw so-and-so. He said, you saw the ghost of Wapanucket. So that's my ghost story today, for whatever it's worth, the ghost of Wapanucket. <laughs>